Hello and welcome to the Mutual Knowledge Podcast. I'm here with Adam Dedelva, Founder and Community Executive Director at DTR, and Jeffrey Turner, Professor at Chapman University. And they're here to talk about funding models for open source projects. Hello, hello. So if you want to tell me a little bit about the project to start, that would be great. Awesome. I guess I'll, I'll quickly uh, go first and then I'll pass it to Jeff. So um, hi, everyone. Adam, I used to work at Microsoft as an Azure specialist and I left D, uh, to found DTR. We conduct research around uh, blockchain technology, around uh, open source software, uh, generally just how to build software somewhere, right, wherever it ends up. Um, and so I work, I work very closely with Jeff Turner as one of our strategic advisors. And I work with him on a project called Abra Vera. And I'll let him introduce himself and explain a little bit more about what we're doing with Abra Vera. So, Jeff? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm an adjunct professor over at Chapman University in the computer science department. And I've been working on open source for several years, along with a set of blockchain and crypto projects. And um, basically, what's come up over the last few years is it's become quite obvious that much of the future of open source is in these new funding models around initial coin offerings and uh, uh, community funding uh, mechanisms, particularly related to tokens and blockchain and even Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, we formed a group. It's now simply just a um, an LLC. It's not yet set up as a DAO, but we're forming a group that creates a new funding model using something called smart wallets and smart contracts to fund open source initiatives. And at, at a high level, that's what Abra Vera is about. Uh, Zoe, if you want, I can share my screen and dig into a little more detail around this if you'd like. Sure, that would be great. Okay, I need permission. Nothing better than a demo. <laughs> yeah, I need permissions to do so. Oh. There we go. All righty, uh, one second here, but... Yeah, the way I see it is that we've gone through basically what happens every time that humanity needs uh, to rescue itself and reinvent itself. We get a new type of capital formation, and um, we're now in a, a new phase of capital formation. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Not yet. Huh. All right. It's not showing the right not showing the right uh, picture. One second. There we go. All right. Hopefully you do that. So uh, as we've um, as we've evolved uh, as humanity or spe uh, specifically and especially Western society, we've had a, a series of different types of capital that have been created uh, to fund uh, different ventures. And we had a colonial and a post-colonial period with the advent of joint stock corporations and things like the East and West India companies or even the Mayflower or many of the uh, uh, colonialization efforts that were originally funded by the crown or monarchies. And we've transitioned now into a post-colonial period where we have um, public corporations and free banking and such. And the big, ad the big thing that, heard around, that happened around this time, especially with the revolutionary wars and such around the world, was things like the Buttonwood Tree Agreement or free banking and bourses, whereby those st the stocks, the equities in those joint stock corporations could be sold on exchanges. And then after World War I and World War II, we moved into what I call a, a free enterprise uh, period. And the big transition here was prior to the world wars, we had private capital, and then we moved into a new form of capital, which was debt-based public capital which is pretty much what most of us think of today, if you're in the crypto space, is TradFi. Um, and there was a huge rise in these ventures with these um, with debt-based money and public-private partnerships and such. And then there was a huge uh, revolution that, if you if you will, that came to, uh, came to the fore with crowdfunding. We had this with Indiegogo or Kickstarter, but really with Bitcoin and even uh, things like Ethereum. And what that in turn did is created uh, a new mechanism for us to fund projects, particularly open source, uh, through tokenization and smart contracts. And now we're in a, a pretty exciting period because we've gone from private capital to debt-based public capital, now to community capital. And, um, and I think this is just the natural evolution of things. 
uh, to put this into perspective, you know, original open source has probably gotten a few hundred billion dollars uh, of funding under the um, uh, under the old model here in the green. And as we've moved into this new uh, orange space, if you will, and uh, especially with related to as that relates to Bitcoin, if you're into the orange orange pill movement around Bitcoin, uh, we've got a new set of capabilities where literally, uh, you know, um, probably over a trillion dollars has been now been put toward open source projects. And that's just in the last uh, dozen years or so. Any thoughts or questions? No, this says a lot. I mean, I've definitely seen pretty deep and dense. So I'm happy to answer anything more specifically about this. But um, I think that this represents really where we are at and where we're going. Yeah, and maybe maybe I can bring this over to a tactical use case, right? So one of the one of the things we saw at Microsoft is you know, open source is important. And so back in the day, Microsoft was looked at as like the closed source, let's, you know, commercialize products and it's our version and we're going to crush competition. And they realized actually we need to invest in this open source movement. And they did that by investing in GitHub, right? So GitHub fits into that green pillar of where we were and where we are. Uh, currently we're transitioning into this, this new phase of community capital. But even then, when you think about what's happening with open source, and there's there's these incredible developers that exist in the world that are, are contributing to code that becomes mission critical to infrastructure, to software packages, to hardware, right? And it's like, how do we keep the, the, the contributors to open source and these uh, critical projects compensated, right? How do they how do they get recognition? How do they get acknowledgement for their contributions to society? Not just from a pat on the back perspective, which they've all got already gotten. How do they get compensated from a monetary perspective? And that's what the Opera Vera framework is really looking to address. Um, there's a massive gap between value created and monetization. Um, so we're looking to equalize that quite a bit. And another tactical use case. So A, we're helping change and reshape the open source crowdsource funding model. That's step one. Step two, well, now that we have a new crowdsource funding model, how do we commercialize products so that when a organization that's a fortune 10 fortune 50 fortune 5000 organization how do we provide those solutions and tools and also get people compensated in that framework so effectively consolidating the open source fog so to speak and then bringing out outcomes as a function so if a customer of a large organization that typically spends for example 50 million dollars a year on a public cloud provider what if they reallocated some of that budget, those, those dollars and cents to an open source funding model? And then from there, we create products that are philosophically aligned to not only that customer, but potentially the world, right? And that's that's where we can now distribute not only wealth, but in innovation. And so my job at Microsoft as an innovation specialist was to actually do some of that, but under the Microsoft umbrella. And it kind of felt a little bit weird because I had this bigger philosophy and the Abrevera framework actually allows for that philosophy to come to fruition with DTR. Uh, by the way, DTR, we have the original author of uh, Docker on our team, uh, which is fun to say, as well as the uh, the founder of the IBM Meta Open Source AI Alliance. So we, ha we have a very core philosophy around open source contributions. Uh, I used to work at Sonatype, which is focused on open source security, right? So like the concepts around open source are very true to me personally. And Abravera enables a new generation of security and just thinking through how to make money in the process of contributing to open source, which is quite radical. So we're very excited to, to contribute to that. That is really amazing. So, you know, it's very upsetting to see hardcore open source contributors out of work. It's absolutely ridiculous. So this, you know, this is a problem that you're addressing from the human capital perspective, as well as innovation perspective, which are obviously aligned. Um, did you want to speak a little bit more about the, you know, contribution and talent management aspect? Undeniably. So I'll give you a very tactical example. There's an incredible open source contributor to an open hardware initiative that uh, potentially may allow for vertically integrated stacks in open hardware chip design, right? What does that mean? What does that translate to? What if we had an open source NVIDIA chip? dot 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 that's disruptive right so so in theory right if you have if you have the right architects the right engineers the right open source project you can crowdsource something like that and we may or may not be involved in that specific initiative and where do we find them 
from the community. So this is just an example of why I'm not chief executive officer, I'm community executive officer, but these are the projects that we can sponsor, fund, crowdsource, and then bring to market by working with the incumbents like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, insert potential uh, partner for this design process. We can work with them to bring better, more cost-effective chips back to the market, especially which can impact uh, the, the emerging markets as well, because they may not have $30,000 for an H100 laying around, right? They they really do need to re reduce costs of overall just general infrastructure and software. And this is how to do it. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Wow. Organic. <laughs> yeah, maybe to take this back a little tangibly in, in this orange period here, if you will, you know, the, uh, Bitcoin came along in 2008, 2009, didn't necessarily have an open source model or a foundation or any formal techniques set up to fund the ongoing development. And some would argue that it's kind of atrophied or um, become ossified as a result. Then Ethereum comes along, um, let's see, seven years ago, I now think, I think it's been. And uh, it has a complete model built into the system itself to provide continuous funding and make sure that those open source developers get paid for the project. Um, now, there's arguments against that through this thing called initial coin offerings. And in fact, we're seeing a divergence in the markets if you follow the crypto markets, whereby Bitcoin's price continues to rise and a lot of the uh, what's called ICOs uh, are, are paling in comparison and, uh, with the valuations that they're set versus Bitcoin. And much of that is due to something called a fair launch. Bitcoin underwent a fair launch, whereas Ethereum had pre-allocated tokens and it was it was previously set up so that um, there were a bunch of people that were rewarded just for simply uh, initiating the project. Uh, we're now entering into a phase with, uh, particularly with things like um, smart wallets that such as on Ethereum and that will soon be coming to Bitcoin, where we can create uh, loan and dividend contracts for projects. So this should provide sustainable funding models for open source simply by embedding a smart contract and a wallet into your project. And that's what Opera Vera is ultimately about. That's amazing. So, um, I mean, I think the big elephant in the room, there's a lot of complaints out there about the lack of funding for open source. But the fact is, we probably have north of a trillion dollars that's been applied to open source projects through these ICO and tokenization uh, approaches with the smart contracts. So uh, it's pretty obvious to me that that's where the transition is going to happen. And the enterprise uh, FOSS models are, are just not receiving the same level of funding that you see in the, uh, the crypto space. Oh yeah, that's for sure. So did you want to speak a little bit about how AI might come into play as far as evaluating the projects, the quality of projects and the quality of contributions and how that might fit into the funding model? You bet. Um, so in fact, my LinkedIn profile is LinkedIn slash in slash decentralized AI. And you can find this diagram up there if you want to download it. Uh, and essentially, I think where we need to move toward is uh, something called verifiable inference so that you can distribute the AI workloads, uh, at least on the inference side. I'm not sure um, with regard to something like NVIDIA, whether uh, the uh, AI is split into two pieces. There's the training side, and then there's the inference side. And I think we're going to see a high degree of decentralization and distribution on the inference side. On the other aspect uh, that I should mention here is that a lot of the existing cloud environments are built on what's called a crash fault tolerant model which has some not quite as good as security properties as you might see otherwise. Um, and you can use something called Byzantine fault tolerance, which is what all the, um, the uh, blockchain based systems are based on, which has much better security and is much more highly decentralized. Up until I think fairly recently though, the problem with Byzantine fault tolerance or it's known as BFT, it just couldn't perform as well as crash fault tolerance could. Uh, but we're rapidly seeing innovation in the space that's making it more performant and lower energy consumption so it can start competing with the existing uh, cloud models using uh, crash fault tolerance. So I think that's ultimately where AI goes because uh, we'll have better security, uh, almost nearly the same performance as you get in the cloud, uh, but we'll probably still be training our AIs 
using these highly centralized um, uh, things like the Blackwell chips from NVIDIA and such, uh, at least for the near future. And as we think about, as you can tell, right, there's a capital capital formation epoch transition. And we've always been talking about for the last eight to 10 years or so, cloud transformation. We, we may end up transitioning from cloud transformation to mist transformation, mist computing. And I think it just rolls off the tongue. I think it's, uh, and so this is a, a big pr part of what, what we're seeing is, you know, there, if, if you can get the same economic impact, um, or efficiencies or better than a public cloud provider, um, why not, right? Again, if it's more secure, it, it has, uh, the potential to be closer to your end user, given the regional concerns of, uh, of the data centers, why not? Yep. So we go from cloud crash fault tolerance to missed Byzantine fault tolerance with AI. Uh, and this this something, no, I, I mentioned it, I guess I forgot to follow up. There's something called verifiable inference that's emerging as well, which means that you know that the AI is giving you inf uh, valid information and that it was executed properly inside that mist so that you can be assured that the question you asked or how you're interacting with it is the actual system and the um, uh, the prompts that you've given it are actually uh, uh, performing against that system that you're expecting. So I think that's going to become another big um, opportunity when it comes to AI and, and decentralizing it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So seemingly, you think that from a security perspective, um, Open source projects um, definitely see see um, a lot of opportunity for security. Um, but are, are there yeah. any downsides that you want to highlight as well? Yeah, there's the, you know this is the standard argument that's been going on now for I think twenty years that proprietary source is uh, perhaps more secure because you have the obfuscation and secrecy related to how the code is written versus versus open source is not as secure because you don't have that. And then the open source crowd will argue that um, uh, there's much greater transparency and you have many more eyes on the code because it is open source and therefore it's gonna have a better security model. But one of the things that's really, I think, coming to the, the forefront now is because you have these highly centralized systems, especially with the proprietary clouds, what we're not seeing is uh, really good security models around that because they're basically highly centralized. If you can go up to the top of the pyramid inside the cloud and get access to the keys, you get to unlock the entire pyramid. And open source systems are more like a canal system whereby you have a bunch of in individual cellular uh, cells, if you will, throughout the fabric. And it's much more difficult to get access to the entire system just because it's not sitting underneath that pyramid. Well, I well, I also think about it, you know, very structurally. I've never heard it quite phrased that way, so I'm going to borrow that because that that just um, that's a really good way of explaining it. Because a lot of people want like you know w one clear answer, um, and not viewing it as, as a, a multifaceted. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, the way I kind of think of it is that open source is organic and more like a biological system, versus. Um, being uh being like a um uh, a synthetic top down coercive system or perhaps um, highly centralized uh, power structure so we're we're it's to me it's going to uh, naturally evolve to a uh, to a better state of things oh yeah and, oh yeah and i apologize i have to jump on to another meeting but if you have any questions feel free to hit me up on linkedin or reach reach out through me uh, reach out to me uh, via email there Sounds great. Wonderful. Adam, Adam. Has, Adam, you have access to this, so feel free to, to, to leverage it and use the slide. Awesome. we Will do. Great. Okay. Bye guys. Thanks, Jeff. So, yeah, I mean, that, that that's great. You know, it's a great way to describe the security problem because, um, yeah, I've never, I've never heard it quite phrased that way. We actually had a web three bug bounty entrepreneur on, explaining the value of that, which was great, especially since a lot of viewers weren't necessarily familiar with how bug bounty worked. But then yeah. you also read about hacks based on um, bad actors knowing how to how to work the code, um, blockchain and otherwise. And 
um, exploiting it. So you see that in the concept of, of security through obscurity um, definitely applies in terms of the proprietary case. Um, but then, I mean, in, in various aspects, there's also security through clarity is also an approach and a benefit, particularly when it comes to architecture and language design. Um, so our chief scientist actually is a language design expert. So he was presenting on that, um, was our um, Moon's language glow for writing dApps versus Solidity, for example. Um, fewer lines of code in general, simpler. Um, he can obviously explain the complexities a lot better, but I really, I mean, I really like what you said about um, the community is where it's at and the community is, it's, it's a very technical concept when it comes to blockchain. Um, it's not just human. So right. it, um, you know, it really is, um, yeah, I mean, it really is one and the same, and it really is interesting, kind of the way of the future. A trillion percent. And so there's there's a lot of these, I hate using this term, but AI thought leaders. And, you know, there's people that have this uh, concern, existential threat around, what do we do when, you know, we have the centralization of power, centralization of intelligence in a few companies? Does that help the people in Ethiopia? Does that help the people in Zimbabwe? Does that help the people in Ghana, in Malaysia, Singapore, you know, all over the world where they don't have as many resources from a financial perspective, but they have the same potential human capacity, right? So those are the types of problems that we were looking to truly solve for on the Abvera and DTR side. I, I've hosted conferences in Ghana while at Microsoft. And um, what I realized is there's just these incredibly talented resources and people humans that are, are there and there's just no visibility they don't they don't know that they exist and so d, d apps decentralized applications along with what we will what we're going to probably end up coining and pushing is miscomputing this puts everyone on an equal playing field for the first time where you now have access to open hardware open software btr is going to be pushing a lot of these open source capabilities to the market it's been what i've been doing for the last eight years which is why Microsoft hired me. But when uh, people put me in a box, I don't do too well. So I had to leave the box. And even at the cloud, the cloud is still a box. It's funny how that works. So um, this is, I think, a way to give back to humanity um, in, a, in a parabolic way. So thinking about things as a Kubernetes cluster, you have your, your worker nodes, you have your call it master node. But in this architecture, everyone ends up being a worker node and everyone can contribute to the work of humanity and, and get compensated in a in a in an aligned model that equals the amount of impact. So a great example of this is again is like crowdsourcing big projects, the types of projects that you can only imagine. Um, and then yes, you imagine it, but then when, what happens when you have 2.9 million engineers behind it, pushing it to the market, bringing it to humanity? Those are the types of alignment problems that DTR can actually uh, solve for with in partnership with the Abreveras of the world. And no one, not many people are talking like this, right? So it's, uh, that's why I threw away the chief executive title office, you know, title away. It's like, I'd rather impact the community. And uh, yeah, my share price for my private publicly traded stock will go up. But I know for a fact that the community has impa been impacted more than I've been able to realize, uh, which we're not sure if that's the case for some of these corporations. Are they are they just siphoning energy from humans, or are they uh, giving back and giving you know uh, providing resources to the humans that that help them get there? Question mark. Great question. It's a really great question. Really amazing points. Um, definitely the future of leadership in terms of that pro thought process and. Um, yeah, well said about that term thought leadership. But but seriously, like at the end of the day, people need the right leadership. People need to be pointed in the right direction, especially as there's so much confusion, potentially misinformation, dis disinformation online. People need the right leadership, the right ways to follow and the right ways to, to follow from wherever they are in the world, um, whatever their diverse perspective is, eliminate those barriers to access because we can, we have these tools. We just need to share it in the right yeah. way. 
And ultimately, we're all just get tired of getting laid off by these corporations when they feel like uh, increasing their market value. Like, I'm just tired of it. I got, you know, I was impacted by layoffs before. Um, and then when, you know, Microsoft laid off 10,000 employees, I made a statement. I said, all right, well, 10,000 employees, let's address the elephant in the room. Why is this corporation with hundreds of billions of dollars or $80 billion in the bank account laying off these people, right? These people have contributed to the share price to get us here. And, uh, you know, when I realized like we weren't safe, I was, I made a double down to double to, to start my business, to start as a founder and, and, and make sure that whatever happens after this, I know that I've done my part and my best to ensure that the community is positively impacted as much as I can. My target personally is hundred million in the next five years. And so as I wear this t-shirt that says, get the millions, it's not necessarily money. It's actually to help positively impact hundred million humans as I go forward with my little startup, my software company that builds enterprise software for uh, the banks of the world and the, you know, the, the organizations that use open source. But um, that's, you know, long-term stuff. So inspiring. I really love it. Oh. Thank you. Wonderful. Really wonderful. So if, there, if there's one piece of advice to kind of the commoner that you can give in navigating all of this, what uh, would it be? A founder? Oh, yeah, probably a new founder. Um, uh, or or oh. not. Or I guess just um, a developer. Developer. But why not? Yeah, developer. No, I thought you said founder. Um, okay, so yeah, developers are like if Microsoft has a meme with with uh what's his name? The old CEO, uh Steve Ballmer. Developers, 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 developers. Yes, awesome, great. But what happens when they're an open source developer and they don't work for a corporation? <laughs> so um getting involved in the Abervera framework early is great. Um that's are more details to be announced there. The idea is you can contribute to code and make money, right? And, and get compensated for your contributions to society. Um, that's part one. Part two is, um, you know, engage with your community, right? Like that's my response to almost every problem is like, what community do you exist in? I engage with them and see how you can help them and ask how you can help them before you ask for uh, how they can help you. Um, and then you'd be surprised what happens as a flywheel. Um, otherwise, you know, if you're just in a silo, you're working by yourself on a problem that nobody else sees, it's not very helpful. So, so use GitHub, leverage the current incumbent tools, but be sure that there are going to be alternatives to the open source forge. So that's our mission. It's to build the forge of open innovation. And I think this is a, a model of how we do that with decentralized applications, blockchain, and uh, overall just open source contributions. Love it. Love it. Stay inspiring, everyone, and follow Adam. And it's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you virtually.